Hello Internet, my name is Jason and I don't own a 90s DOS gaming machine. I know, I know. It's a sad state of affairs. I don't have a computer to play Quake or SimCity 2000 or Red Alert and Command and Conquer. It's a sore spot and something I'm trying to deal with. And I have. This here is my Compact Presario 5522. It is from Compact's fairly classic line of all-in-one machines, which kind of ran from the 486-ish era to the Pentium-ish era. Uh, and this particular one is a Pentium 75. It's got 16 meg of RAM and a two gig hard drive. Uh, we won't get all into the details until we start poking around at the motherboard, uh, but as it currently stands, it all works. Everything except for the power button, which is your typical kind of latching power button, and the internals of it shattered about three days after I got it. So as it currently stands, this is jammed on, and I'm using a power cable with an inline switch, and that will do for now, because I did have this apart once, and I don't intend to do it again if I don't have to. So when I got it, the only thing really wrong with it was this front panel here had been painted at some point in its life. Uh, the reason for that is that it had obviously had some crack repairs, um, but the paint job on it was pretty average, so I took it unto myself to repair it, um, sand it right back, fix the cracks again, because it wasn't particularly well done the first time, and repaint it. Now, that uh, exercise was going to be uh, a video unto itself until it took about three days of constant sanding uh, to get it looking where it is. Now, three days of constant sanding is boring as hell for me, let alone making you watch it. Uh, but the short version is, as I sanded back all the original paintwork, uh, I re-repaired re uh, the cracks, which were quite substantial. To give you an idea, this is actually how much it was cracked. It was then followed by a lot of filling, sanding, filling, sanding, filling, sanding, filling, priming, sanding, filling. And finally, I was able to put some paint down just yesterday, and here we are. But all in all, it's a fairly reasonable machine. Now, as it currently stands, it's already running DOS 6.2.2 and Windows 3.1. I haven't really needed to touch any of the software um, because it just works. Uh, as far as I can tell, the previous owner had just done a fresh install, so that's fine by me. But as it sits here, it does play games okay. You've got to remember that the Pentium 75 really wasn't that much better than a 486DX. Um, so that's kind of really what we're dealing with. Uh, and I'm pretty sure even back in the day when I had a 486, it had 32 meg of RAM, not just 16. Um, but it works fine and we can spark up, say, Doom, and it plays fairly reasonably. Now, it will also play Quake, and I did actually run a time demo on it, and as it currently stands, it gets an FPS of 13.9, which is not great. So, it wouldn't be one of my videos if I wasn't going to throw some upgrades at it, so let's go with that. So, before we go ripping this thing apart, let's take a quick look round the back. We've obviously got our PS2 port, serial, parallel, uh, a game port, uh, and an onboard uh, sound card with headphone and all the rest of it. And tucked up here is a 56, I believe, K modem, or it could be a 33.6. Uh, and it kind of just fills what seems to be a proprietary gap. Now, to get into this, this machine is, and you'll probably recognize this if you are a classic Mac user, the whole motherboard just nicely slides out the back. And we're in. So before we pull this whole thing apart, let's take a bit of a look around. Uh, we've got an S3 Trio 64V uh, video card, or video chip at least, just here, uh, as well as a S3 MX2, uh, which I'm assuming is some kind of MPEG-2 decoder, which is kind of nice. 
but there's also a pin header for a TV tuner uh, and one that's called VGA Feature, which I'm guessing is extra memory perhaps for the S3. Uh, stuck up here is a header for a uh, wavetable add-on uh, to go with the uh, ESS sound card. Over here we have 8 meg of RAM on board, plus then two 4 meg uh, sticks to give us our 16. Uh, tucked up underneath this heatsink is our Pentium 75, uh, and here is a ISA modem. Uh, it seems to go straight into uh, a proprietary, well, a cutout at least on the back. Normally I would pull something like that out, but in this case there doesn't seem to be any real need. So what we're going to put into this machine is I've got uh, some more RAM to go in this, so we're going to replace these two 4s with actually two 32s, uh, which maxes this thing out at 72 meg. Uh, and I've also got a Pentium 133 to replace the Pentium 75 that's currently sitting under this heatsink. So let's get to it. Right, we will start by carefully removing the memory. Now, if you've ever used 72-pin SIMs, you'll know they use little plastic brackets which can snap just by looking at them the wrong way. So we're just going to get them out of the way. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do, just simply to make life a little easier, is I'm just going to remove the modem momentarily, uh, which should just be that one screw, and there we go. Okay, processor. Uh, this is fairly straightforward, it's just got a clip. If I can get it to unclip, there we go. That comes off, heatsink with some rubbish old um, thermal paste. Open the latch, lift the processor out, put our new 133 in, in the right orientation, because it has a little cutout there. And you should just drop in. And we're in. Okay. Um, now, I can't really remember if Pentium's needed uh, thermal paste, but seeing as the old one had it, we're just going to put a little bit on and I might grab some IPA and clean up the old one. There we go, heat sink is now all nice and clean. You can be placed carefully back onto there. Put our clip back on. With that on, we now need to change some jumpers because of the different clock speeds and the like which means changing one of these jumpers here from 1, 2 to 2, 3, if I can get it out. This is actually why I removed the modem to make this easier. Come on. Right, starting to get there. Well, I got both off. Right, so B stays at one, two, you go to two, three. Uh, and then over here we have the bus speed, which we need to change to 66. That's now all done, and I can put the modem back in. And the only other thing we're going to put in here is actually a network card, which I will explain why soon. So out comes the blanking plate. In goes this. This is a Intel Ether something Pro 10 Plus, Ether Express, I think it's called. Right. And there's all our upgrades done. No, it's not. I've got to put the RAM back in. So we've got two 32 meg sticks here. These are actually out of an apple. I hope no one crucifies me for that. And these just drop in. 
Now, one thing I did find out with this machine the hard way is this is not EDO RAM. It's the previous version, which the name escapes me at the moment, FRU RAM or something along those lines, uh, which made finding RAM a little tricky. And I actually found this in a old uh, Performer 5300 that I've got kicking around. So that gives us a full 72 meg. And as I said, that maxes the machine out. So before we get into some games and some benchmarks and all that kind of stuff, there is a topic I wanted to cover, and it's the reason I put that Ethernet card in there. When you have an old machine similar to this, getting software on it short of replacing the hard drive with a compact flash can be a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, now, in this particular case, it's got an optical drive, so I could burn whatever I want to CD and just do it that way. That's fine. But if you've got, say, uh, I don't know, like a 386 or a 286, or even an XT where an optical drive just isn't really feasible or it doesn't have one, the other best option is via network. Now, finding 8-bit network cards can be a little tricky. 16-bit ISA ones are a little easier. Um, but so I've put that uh, Intel uh, Ethernet card in there. And on a floppy disk, all I've done is I've copied a program called MTCP. Now, MTCP isn't actually a program per se, it's a set of programs, uh, but essentially it's a TCP implementation for DOS. And the main two things that we're after uh, in this particular instance is getting the packet driver for the Intel NIC running uh, and starting an FTP server. So the two things you're going to need is obviously MTCP and all the utilities that come with it and the packet driver for your uh, particular network card. I can't really help you with the latter. It's going to take some Googling uh, and it took me a few attempts to find the correct one for this. But if I go into uh, MTCP directory, which is where I dumped everything and go dir. Uh, my particular one is the one called epropacket.com uh, and that is the packet driver for this network card. So there's a couple of things we do need to do. Now I've already done it on this machine but if we go uh, edit ccom backslash I'm pretty sure it's in configs.sys we need to set an environment variable of where the MTCP configuration file is. Now I'm just using the sample file. Uh, so it's uh, C drive MTCP uh, sample dot CFG, right? Okay, done. So that tells the computer where the configuration file is. And if we take a quick look at the uh, configuration file, sample dot CFG, right? Here it is here. Now, I really haven't changed anything in here at all. All I've done is set where the FTP server um, password file is, which is, in my case, it's just M uh, C MTCP FTP pass.txt, easy. Um, and all I've done is set the IP address of this machine, which is 10.0.0.1, um, Netmask 255.255.0 and the rest in this particular case doesn't really matter. Now, there is a DHCP utility which will automatically update this little bit of the configuration file uh, if you're running um, DHCP on your network. Uh, I'm just simply doing this with a cable between two machines, so two static IP addresses. Right, so that's that. The first thing you want to do is launch the packet driver. Now, again, this can be a little tricky, um, but uh, if I go, just hang on a sec, if I go back into my sample, uh, 06x60 is uh, the address I want, right? All you really need to do with this one at least is launch, um, we'll load, the packet driver, so E Pro PKT, and we want to go 0x60, and it's on an IRQ, I believe, of 5. Okay. And there we go, the packet driver is launched. Now, all we need to do is to go FTP SRV, which is the FTP server, 
and the FTP server on this machine is now started. Now I prefer it to do it that way because it means then on my normal Windows laptop when I'm connecting to it I can just use FileZilla or something like that instead of trying to drive the FTP client on this machine uh, through command line and all the rest of it. So let me hook up my laptop and I'll show you where we go from there. So here on my laptop, I've simply got, I'm actually using a USB-C network card because this machine doesn't have onboard ethernet, uh, and just a straight through cable into the back of the compact, because uh, this being gigabit, you don't have to worry about crossovers and stuff. Right, so if we spark up FileZilla, The only other thing I've done here is on that network card, I've set a static IP address of 10.0.0.2, which obviously then matches the, uh, the Compaq. If we simply go 10.0.0.1, uh, in my FTP pass, I've simply gone lurch and password, because I'm creative, and we now have, we're at drive C, uh, and you probably heard the Compaq go beep, saying that something is connected. From here, we can simply browse the entire C drive and copy anything across that we want. So as an example, what haven't I copied across yet? Uh, let's go Carmageddon. Uh, so over here, we'll go create new directory Karma. Um, where did that go, Karma? and we can copy across uh, Carmageddon. And uh, on the compact, you can see uh, the activity going on as each file gets copied across. Now, don't forget that this is only a 10 meg network. This is not going to be the fastest thing in the world, um, but it is a reasonably easy way of getting files across to your vintage computer. And we're back. So, about three seconds after I stopped recording that FTP transfer, this thing started to throw hard drive errors. It was something along the lines of cannot write to sector. And I thought, damn it, the original 2 gig hard drive has finally kicked the bucket. So I started a lot of head scratching uh, and worked out what I could do with what I had around me. And I had a spare 4 gig hard drive. So I threw that in and um, started loading up DOS again, uh, only to find that FDisk would only see 500 meg. 503 to be exact. And I thought to myself, that's not right. So a lot of hunting on the internet, I found the original setup disk for this machine, which is what you need to uh, do BIOS changes. I had a look and the BIOS was detecting the correct um, cylinders, heads and sectors and saying it was a 4.1 gig hard drive. But JOS just simply went, nope, that's 503. So I continued on. Uh, and it turned out to be incredibly unreliable and I started getting cannot write to sector errors again. So I thought that was strange. Bit more hunting on the internet uh, and it sounds like that it is simply a BIOS limitation. It may say that it, it's got a 4.1 gig hard drive, uh, but there seems to actually be a limit of about two gig. More internet searching, uh, and I remembered about OnTrack Disk Manager, which is basically a BIOS overlay for DOS um, that uh, allows you to use bigger drives in older machines. Installed that, created a couple of 2 gig F, uh, FAT16 uh, partitions, and I was off and running. At that point, I could have left it. Um, but there was something just not quite right with the way it's running. Uh, and I really wanted to get away from using OnTrack because uh, I thought that might have been the issue. Turns out it wasn't. Uh, it was more basically just my imagination after arguing with this thing for about a day and a half. So I thought, okay, I need another two gig hard drive. So I whipped out a compact flash uh, IDE adapter, found a two gig uh, compact flash card, 
and bang, uh, DOS saw all two gig of it, installed it, all happy. Uh, it was actually a two gig um, compact flash that I had used messing around with one of my Tandys. Uh, and I can't remember the reason behind it, but it had just an 80 meg partition on it, but the full hard, FDisk can see the full hard drive. And I actually just plugged it in and it booted. So I thought, all right, that's a great start. I'm not gonna rebuild it again. I'll just create a second partition of like 1.9 gig or whatever it is, and off we're going. Now, in this machine, uh, it's a little cramped, as you can probably imagine. Uh, and to really, for me at least, one of the main benefits of a compact flash hard drive is the ability to actually pull it out, copy files, put it back in, uh, and get files onto your computer that way, which I should point out then completely defeats the purpose of everything I did with the network card, but at least that was a good uh, exercise and I was able to show you that. Right, so it was at that point that I had the compact flash all loaded up and I turned my attention back to the original two gig hard drive and I worked out what I had done wrong. Remember I said I had a four gig hard drive kicking around? Well, the day before filming the first bit of this video, I had actually been uh, messing around trying to get it working in this machine before, and I hadn't really spent that much time on it. What I had done is this. I put the four gig hard drive in, uh, went into the BIOS, manually configured the cylinders, heads and sectors, and it was at that point, it's still, DOS still only saw 503 meg or whatever it was, and I gave up and I put the two gig hard drive back in. But when I put the two gig hard drive back in, I didn't change the settings in the BIOS. Now, the only difference between the two hard drives is they were both the same type, they both had the same uh, sectors, and they both had the same uh, heads, they just had, the four gig had twice as many cylinders. So obviously the machine was actually able to boot and run from the two gig hard drive. And then when I got most of the way through my FTP transfer, it obviously started to write to bits of the hard drive that weren't actually there. And at that point, it ate the file allocation table. So with everything up and running with the compact flash, I put the two gig hard drive, the original two gig hard drive back in and I was able to F-disk it, for, uh, petition it, format it, whatever. So it's in there as well. So as you can probably imagine, I've now got obviously the CD-ROM, I've got the original two gig hard drive uh, running in there and the compact flash, and it gets a little crowded. Let me show you hardware-wise how I managed to kind of wire that all up. Right, in the front of this machine, the hard drive, the original hard drive is here, CD-ROM is here. And the two IDE channels are here, one in front of each other. Now, originally, the hard drive ran as master on IDE 0, and this was master on uh, IDE 1. So, what I've done is, this is now uh, slave on IDE 1, this is master on IDE 1, so they're both on the same channel. And then the compact flash now has a custom-made IDE cable, which goes in, makes a uh, 90 degree turn, another 90 degree turn, and heads straight out the back. So we now need to have a look at the back of the machine, and I can show you what I did there. Right, so this is where all the magic happens. As you can see, I've opened up the uh, motherboard drawer. So this is the cable that runs all the way from the front of the machine, from the IDE connector, comes all the way back, does a 90 degree turn and then actually does a 90 degree turn backwards, does a full flip because of the orientation of the IDE connector on the compact flash adapter and obviously that's it. Here, uh, because this is pin one over this side. So this is a custom cable I ended up making um, and it, yeah, it does. it's long and it does various flips and all the rest of it. Uh, and this is simply just the five volt power, uh, which is tacked into one of the back of the Molex connectors, I think the uh, CD-ROM one. So that's kind of how it all ended up. Now, obviously the downside of this is you can't just pull the uh, motherboard drawer out anymore. Uh, you do have to disconnect these two cables or something similar to be able to remove the hard drive. But the upshot is, is this now has a compact flash hard drive, 
uh, which means getting files onto it is even easier, uh, even though I did just show you the uh, networking side of things. Um, not exactly what I had planned, but it's a solution, and it's a solution I came up with fairly rapidly. Mind you, I now owe uh, one of my computers a, a compact flash adapter. I may have borrowed it. Okay, so given I had to give this thing a complete reload, uh, which was not planned, I then started to look into the rabbit hole that is DOS memory management on a machine like this. Now, memory management is something I touched on a bit in my one of my Tandy 1000 videos, uh, but it was purely dealing with the 640K base memory and then using some upper memory blocks. This has got 72 meg of RAM. Um, this is a completely different ball game. And also, once you get past the 386 era, DOS does a lot of the heavy lifting for you with different memory management techniques and applications and things like that. So I started looking into things like expanded versus extended uh, versus just conventional RAM. And I was doing a bunch of research online until I discovered that uh, Phil's Phil from Phil's Computer Lab has actually done it all for us. Uh, I'll put a link into the description, uh, but he's got a standard set of uh, setup files which just work, with one exception. Uh, he's included uh, the CT mouse driver, which is fine, it's what I use on these machines as well, but it's version 2, and on this using PS2 it crashes. So the only thing I had to do was roll it back to version 1.9, and it works like a dream. So let me show you. One of the things he did was uh, set up basically a boot menu which allows you to choose various options. And most of it comes down to how much base memory you want to uh, free up. So if we have a look here, we've got uh, expanded memory plus mouse and CD-ROM, extended memory, mouse and CD-ROM, conventional memory, mouse and CD-ROM, plus the same three again without the CD-ROM uh, driver because it does take up about 20k of RAM. Now the differences are actually quite substantial. Um, with the expanded memory uh, option uh, choosing CD-ROM, I get about 630-ish k of free base memory. Um, extended memory is a, just shy of 600k, uh, and conventional memory only drops that down to about 540k of base memory. So it all depends on what you're actually trying to run um, because some games uh, require lots of base memory, even in this era, some don't. Uh, so this is a really easy way of getting around that old thing that we had to do, which was, remember you had to have like specific boot disks for specific, specific boot disks for specific games. No need to do that. Uh, we've got our options all in uh, the config sys and auto exec bat files, which is brilliant. So here we are, expanded memory, and I'll just quickly do check disk, if I spell it right. And here you go, 632k of free memory, which is actually fairly good. Now, as I mentioned in my rundown of fixing this machine, fixing-ish, um, this now actually basically has three partitions, three hard drives, uh, and I believe everything for the games and stuff ended up on E drive. No, it didn't. E drive is the second partition on the compact flash. D drive uh, is where I've dumped all my games. Now, at the beginning of this video, um, I uh, ran a benchmark. I said I ran a benchmark on the standard configuration with the Pentium 75 uh, and the 16 meg of RAM and I got 13 and a bit frames per second. If I run it now, and I get 19.3 frames per second, which to me still doesn't seem fantastic, but I guess it is still only a Pentium 133. We've got no MMX. Uh, we've thrown a bunch of RAM at it, obviously, but the video card's also the same. But in the end of the day, that's what, a 30, 40% increase, which can't really complain about that. So having played around with this machine now for four or five days, which is admittedly a couple of days longer than planned, but I'm not really complaining, I've worked out that this machine is kind of like 
it's like an amazing 486, right? Or just a average Pentium machine, which is exactly what it is. It's only a 133 uh, and it isn't MMX, so we don't have the benefit of that. Um, as much as we've thrown a stack of RAM at it, it's still uh, got the S3 video card in there. So you're kind of looking at games, so Quake 1 would kind of be the most you would want to throw at this machine. As you saw, it got 19 frames per second in the time demo. It's more than playable. Um, but obviously, Doom, play with its eyes closed. Um, all the uh, kind of XT286, 386, 486 games, not a problem whatsoever. Uh, it does a really good job of uh, playing SimCity 2000, which I admit I may have tested a lot, um, and because uh, I quite like SimCity games. And SimCity 2000 is actually not a game I've played since I was a kid, uh, and yeah, that add probably a day of that four or five days in just for SimCity 2000. Um, so come again and things like that, not a problem. Uh, it does an admiral job of playing uh, Star Wars TIE Fighter, which was a favorite of mine as a kid. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what this machine is capable of. So the other type of game that I was kind of reminded about when uh, putting this machine together is a lot of the VGA remakes of various classic adventure games. Um, so Sierra did a bunch of them for uh, Space Quest and things like that, but also The Secret of Monkey Island got a VGA update as well. And it's probably one of the best um, point and click adventure games out there. Even that's coming from me, who grew up on Sierra games. LucasArts did a fantastic job of this game and it plays really, really well with the onboard sound blast. So yeah, we don't have MIDI or any of those things, but it's a very, very pleasant uh, gaming experience on this machine. So there we go, there is my all-in-one compact Presario. Uh, I'm not going to deny it didn't quite go to plan. There were things in this video I hadn't planned for, but in the end we are able to throw some upgrades at the machine, improve its performance at least a little bit, and in the end create a reasonably good DOS gaming machine. Now, obviously, the next step after this is when we start uh, getting into 3D acceleration, like voodoo cards and all the rest of it. And that's not really what I was aiming at. I wanted just a good machine to play those classic VGA adventure games, the early first-person shooters, and stuff like that. And I think mission accomplished. I'll make sure I put links to uh, the stuff that I picked up off uh, Phil's computer lab uh, down in the description. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank my wonderful patrons, like these people here. And that will just about do it. If you like the video, click like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff, and I will see you in the next one.